I wonder why I can't shake the feeling of being an outsider like Alice, despite most everyone being so hospitable and friendly with me. Turning another page, my mind starts drifting further away from the book. It's quiet. I can hear my heartbeat thumping against the fabric of my shirt. For some reason, it makes me feel really bad like that since that time in the forest with Iwanako, like I was locked in a cage for something nasty and scary. I put the book down for a while and stare at the ceiling, taking my time to shake off, that f off the feeling. 200 pages later, I fall asleep. So, is it going to be the transition to the next day? Okay, so that is what the transition is. It's not a new chapter, it's the next day. Like, as it loads or something, I assume. The students roll into class for the Saturday morning session, each and every one of them sporting the tired eyes of people who have worked through the night. With only a day left to prepare, I suppose not so, so, I suppose not so surprising. Thankfully, we only have to suffer through classes until the lunch break, and then our time is our own. Mato Mato lurches into the class in a tired stagger. I suppose students aren't the only ones, aren't the only people here that enjoy their late Friday nights. Without saying a word, he scrawls some page and question numbers on the board and slumps down at his desk. It's completely atypical behavior for him, but it appears that no one in the class is going to call him out on it. Wordlessly, the students shuffle their textbooks into position and get to work, not wanting to break the trend. I do the same. Fatigue has made the class antisocial. Not a peep is heard among the ruffling papers. That can partly be attributed to the two empty seats beside me. For some reason, Misha and Shizune aren't present, probably doing council work for the festival. It's very, uh, quiet without Misha present. I wonder if she was born as rowdy as she is, or if she is making up for Shizune's lack of voice. Nakai, can I speak to you for a moment? I'm so engrossed in thinking about Misha that I don't even notice Muto approaching my desk. Sure, what's this about? It's probably better if we speak outside the classroom. Oh no. Something about this doesn't sound too good, but I stand up and follow him out into the hallway. Muto stands in the hallway, scratching his head as he works out what he's trying to say. Not knowing what's going on, I wait silently. I heard from the school's head nurse that you had an incident the other day. Ah, so it's about that. Well, kind of, but it's not anything to be worried about. Uh, yes, yes it is. Anything that can endanger your health is something to be worried about. We try our best here to prepare you for life here. Part of that involves knowing your limits and how to work around them. It would be remiss of me if I didn't speak up about this. Alright, I get it, I'm sorry. But though it closes his eyes in frustration and I realize that this probably wasn't the best thing to say. Something tells me that you're not sorry. Pretend as much as you want, but this isn't a normal school. A lot of people have put in a lot of time, effort, and money to make sure that you, and every other student here, can have the same level of education as your peers. For you to abuse that by throwing out advice, especially medical advice, is plain selfish. I'm not quite sure if this, actually, if this is actually how he feels, or if it is some act that he's practiced many times to guilt trip students into doing the right, Jesus, into doing the right thing. Either way, it's working. I understand, this is all new to me, and I apologize. I know my limits now, and I'll be sticking to them. But who appears to lighten up a little bit, satisfied that his message has been received. So then, on to my next question. How are you finding your studies? I understand you're laid up for a while. We're not too far ahead, are we? I don't really think so. I tried to keep up when I was in the hospital, so it hasn't been too hard. But who taps his chin and raises an eyebrow as he absorbs this information. Is that so? I suppose there are still students out there who realize the importance of learning. I wouldn't go that far, I was only trying to keep myself occupied in my little life support prison. Well, yeah, you've got to keep up with these things, right? That's exactly it. One wrong move in this world and you're left behind, right? Er, right. Wouldn't want that to happen. No. No, you wouldn't. Every week there's a new scientific discovery. Most of them meaning nothing to the layperson. Most of them mean nothing to the layperson, but any one of them could be the key to the next big thing. I'll keep that in mind. It's obvious that Mateo's serious talk is over and he's gone back to his standard, slightly scatterbrained approach to life. I think, in hindsight, that I prefer him this way. He's slightly more predictable in his unpredictability. 
Well then, I think that's all that I really had to say. Let's get back inside, shall we? My relief of that suggestion is insurmountable. Sure, you're the boss, right? Mateo pauses for a moment. I don't think any of my students have ever said that to me before. For an instant, for an instant I considered replying to this, but something deep within me tells me to shut my mouth and get back into the classroom. A few of the students jump at the sound of the door, rapidly trying to pretend that they are working on the questions on the board. Some don't even bother, their heads slumped on the desk as they nap. Thankfully, it would appear that Mateo does not even notice them. He probably notices, just doesn't care. He returns to his desk and retrieves a scientific journal from one of the drawers. I guess I got to him there. The class returns to the near silence that Mateo and I left in before our chat. Makes feelings of tiredness and anticipation buzz around the room. Everyone here is either waiting for a chance to rest or the chance to get their last minute preparations underway. The clock on the wall slowly ticks, the remaining class time away, until finally the bells cry out ending the torment. Before you all leave, I expect these answers for those problems by Monday. The class size is one, instantly regretting slacking off, but still acutely aware of the more pressing issues at hand. The classroom empties in a blink as everyone rushes to their last minute festival preparations. I stay behind and try to quickly finish the question so I don't have to bother with it over the rest of the weekend, with the festival and all tomorrow. Apart from me, Hanukkah is the only one left, obviously waiting for Lily. It's weird that Lily comes all the way to our classroom to pick her up. I expect that moving around is at least nominally harder for her than it is for Hanako. But it's none of my business, and I'm naturally don't ask about it from Hanako. Despite the relative proximity of her seats, Nita tries to strike up a co Nita tries to strike up a conversation about that or anything else either, so an oppressive silence falls upon the classroom. Time passes in silence. It's probably just 15 minutes or so, but it feels longer. I turn pages of my notebook. Hanako turns pages of the novel she's reading. My pencil lids when this against the paper just when I was about to finish a paragraph. The sounds of my irritated silence as a quick fumbling around for a sharpener feel like they're breaking the mood in the classroom. Hanako keeps her eyes firmly away from my direction. Before long, Lily's tall figure appears in the doorway. Hanako? Her name is all it takes to make Hanako jump up from her desk and run to Lily. Oh, that's cute. They talk quietly for a moment, but it isn't long before Lily leaves down the hall and Hanako idles back into the classroom, taking her seat once again. I watch Hanako out of the corner of my eye out of sheer curiosity at the, at the idea that the two would be separated. For a couple of minutes, she does nothing but sit with her chin in her hand, staring at the desk dejectedly. The boredom evidently becomes too much for her, though, her slender frame reaching into her bag and pulling out a small book. Come to think of it, that isn't the one I saw her reading at the library. She must be quite a fast reader to get through them at this rate. After about ten minutes of resolutely shuffling in her seat and trying to read, Hanako closes her book and leaves, too. As should I, since the assignment is all but finished and there's nothing else to do in the classroom. Not that I have anything to do anywhere else, either. The school's a beehive of activity, but no one pays me any heed. I saunter past classrooms filled with students frantically doing this and that, buzzing around like little worker bees. You wouldn't guess the school day is over. It's a bit quieter outside, but not by much. People zip by, left and right, hurrying as quickly as they can, busy and energetic. To me, they got louder outside than what they were inside. I feel the opposite. The midday sun seems to be draining all the spirit out of my body, making it feel limp all over. Warm, soft air flows inside my shirt, feeling like a cushion. I yawn lazily, thinking about what I'd do. I'll drop off my books at the dorms first, and then, something I haven't decided yet. Maybe Kenji is in his room. On the way to the dorms, I spot Emmy coming my way, running despite not having those weird running prosthetics on. I wave at her, and she skids to a stop. So wait, what'd she have on then? Yo, Hassal. Spat as a wet and green paint door on her nose and chin respectively, but her smile is wide, as it seems it always is. She leans closer to me, amplifying the feeling she is examining me. Huh, what's she examining for? What you doing? Nothing, really. I don't have anything to do with the festival and everyone else seems to be doing something important. Are we going to help paint? That's perfect. Then you can help me and Rin. With the festival preparations? Eh, I'm not sure if I would be of much help. That's fine, I'm not much help either. And he grabs my wrist and starts dragging me back inside the school quite forcefully. Even her walking speed is more like jogging, making me stumble over myself simply trying to keep up. 
the stairs slowed down Emmy a little bit. Maybe it's hard to climb with her legs, or maybe she's finally run out of breath. We go all the way back to the third floor into the seniors' hallway, ending up where I left five minutes ago. I could just as well have stayed here waiting for Emmy, had I known. Wait, couldn't she have... Uh, shouldn't they have an elevator in the school for stuff like that? Or would that be too expensive? I don't know, it's just... To me, I thought it makes sense for people who don't have legs. So are you... Is Rin working on that mural still? That's right, she needs all kinds of paint and, and brush... She needs all kinds of paints and brushes and stuff, so I went to get them from the art classroom. And you need me to help with that. Well, Rin told me you had already helped her, so I thought you wouldn't mind. I see. So thanks to Emmy's flaky logic, here I am again, collecting stuff from the art classroom for other people. The room is empty apart from ourselves and the lonely specks of dust floating in the air. Emmy skips straight away to the back wall, digging out a tiny, crumpled piece of paper from her pocket. When she tries to make sense of the scrawled handwriting, I take a closer look at the materials lying around here. Dozens of paint cans and bottles are arranged on the shelves in a most unorganized fashion. Some look like they have been left there for several decades, relics of previous art club generations. Next to the heavy stacks of neatly piled paper are boxes full of different sized brushes and unsorted crayons. The smells of paint, turpentine, and fresh paper float in the stale air, mixing in my nostrils to form that unmistakable scent of art. What is turpentine for? I never used it for art, but I always uh, heard like Bob Ross mention it in his videos. Emmy studies her notes, comparing them to markings on the various paint cans, and passes them to me if she finds the correct matches. She stretches her neck to look on the topmost shelf, but it's not quite enough. Her eye level stays below the shelf no matter what she does, and it gives up and just looks up to the shelf longingly, like a child at a toy store huffing in annoyance. At her moment of building anger, she starts jumping up and down, apparently trying to speed read the labels during the fashion of a second she can see them, and catch what she can. It's no surprise that she fails miserably, and almost manages to bring the entire shelf crashing down. Now I see why lending a hand- now I see why me lending a hand here would be useful. Come on, let me do that. You can't jump high enough, and I don't want you to hurt yourself trying. Also, I'm like twice your height. You are not. She turns around, flaring scorn, flushed cheeks and all. Just kidding, just kidding. Anyway, I'll look up there, okay? She glares at me one more time, but can't come up with a retort. With a grudging humph, she turns her back to me. So I begin scrounging around the top shelf for paint while below. Emmy crouches to scavenge what she can from the cupboards. I shake my head a little, after double-checking to ensure she can't see me do so. Emmy having a complex about her height was a surprise. I wouldn't have joked about it otherwise. She seems easygoing, but I guess everyone has her weak spots. After, only after we have almost all the items collected and spread out on a desk like a treasure hunter spoils do I realize that it wasn't necessarily the height chat that got her riled up. She might not like to be told that she can't do something, like jump. But Emmy seem, herself seems to have forgotten all about it already. Quick to anger, quick to forgive. Is she that type of person? At least she doesn't seem to have taken anything to heart as she chatters away happily while we pick up the rest of the items and then make our way back to Rin. I chivalrously carry the bulk of the materials as we make our way towards the dormitories. Rin is really stressed out getting her painting done. It's her own fault though, she should have started earlier. Is she going to make it? No idea, it looks good to me, but with Rin, you never know what's going on. I found her this morning lying in front of the dorm in fetal position. She hadn't slept all night. I can't believe that the night nurses hadn't found her. And now she's painting again like crazy. Yeah, I've noticed that she comes off as kind of unhinged, so to speak. I don't know why, my mind thought, like, why do they have night nurses? But that's good for something, like, in case of Hassan, if something happens with his heart at night, nurses would be there. Yeah, I've noticed that she comes off kind yeah, I've noticed that she comes off as kind of unhinged, so to speak. Did I already read that? I can't remember. And they giggles at that, as well as my most likely too obvious awkwardness. I don't mind it, she's just a little weird sometimes. On that, I can agree with her. Unlike me, Emmy seems to be cool with Rin's whatever it is that feels so off about her. Still, they don't feel close like Misha and Shizune do, with them working as a single entity sometimes. It's hard to say where one ends and the other begins. Even though they're so different, just like Emmy and Rin are. And Rin is the most different of them all. Different from anyone else I've met. Yeah, I guess she's a very unique person. I return to that word again as if it comes to Rin's personality by itself, but really just a substitute for a lengthy description of her oddities. It's hard to describe a, Rin, a person like Rin in one word. Emmy, gra 
any giggles as I grasp out for a properly descriptive word. She's just weird. I mean, yeah, that's basically it. You know, earlier she just spent half an hour sitting on her box. On her box? Huh. I want to save real quick. The scene is anesthetics and the track is everyday fantasy.